reasonably relaxed about surrendering some of the, uh, the knockdown power. They went to the 38, and things get a little bit messy here. Firstly, they looked at, uh, at the Webley. The Webley company was a commercial manufacturer of firearms for the police force and post office and bank managers, etc. Webley came up with this design. It was submitted, but it was felt that it was a little bit expensive and was therefore rejected. It came back into vogue in 1942 when the Enfield pistol, which I'll talk to in a minute, which was adopted as a service pistol, it didn't have enough production capacity. So the Webley people were encouraged to uh, kick back into production, uh, which they did. And one of the things you'll see on the Webley is, of the war manufactured Webleys, is the words war finish applied. We saw this with the shotguns, the American shotguns, the Remington um, and Winchester shotguns. It was a way of the commercial manufacturers from just <laughs> defending their brand and, and indicating that the finish on this is not the finish that would be consistent with what you would expect as a customer if you were buying one of their commercial pistols. Again, it's a top op open, top break, 38, very easy to fire, virtually mechanically identical to the, to the uh, 455. The design itself was, it was suspected that the Enfield people who subsequently won the contract for the British Army, it's suspected that they nicked a lot of the design features from Webley and there was a lawsuit that ensued as a result of that. They're obviously looking at them, they're very, very similar. The British Army did adopt uh, the Webley, um, I'm sorry, the, the Enfield as its service pistol, 38 calibre, same deal, top, top open, top break open. This one was manufactured I think in the 1930s, where's the date here? Just see it, this one is 1931. So it's reasonably early on, it's got the wooden, the wooden grips and the, um, uh, the lanyard ring down the bottom. As a result of their experience in, in the early part of the, of the Second World War, the Brits decided to change the uh, design of the revolver. They found that tank crews uh, who were issued with, with revolvers, when they were climbing out of the, the armoured vehicle, there was a tendency for the hammer to catch and the revolver to cock itself. And there's no safety catch, so obviously that's, uh, that's pretty uh, serious implications as far as safety is concerned. So they withdrew these by degrees, uh, the ones that were in service, and started to convert them to the new manufacturing spec, which you see here. Same pistol, but without the hammer spur, and it's firing in double action only. They lightened the hammer spring a wee bit to make the trigger operation a little easier. Uh, and in addition to that, they've changed the contours of the butt just to make it a little bit more stable and firmer platform for double action firing. So we've got, as I told you, it gets complicated. We've got the Enfield Mark I, followed by the Enfield Mark I Star, which is this one, hammer spur removed. And late in the war they came out with an Enfield Mark I Two Star. The Two Star had a safety stop removed and a few other things simplified for mass production. However, it led to uh, some concerns about issues of safety. And after the war, they were withdrawn. The Two Star was withdrawn and converted back to the One Star. So I mean, it's, a, it's a hideously complicated tale. Double action only is pretty inaccurate. The pistols themselves, the revolvers themselves, are really only intended as a self-defense weapon. The only people who took the handgun seriously as a legitimate and potent infantry weapon were the Americans. And they had the, you know, the 1911 and 45 caliber. They were also, the Americans were generally better trained uh, in handgun use, uh, more of a handgun culture in the civilian world as well as a more generous allocation of ammunition for training purposes. The Brits were per perennially afflicted with the problem of ammunition, access to ammunition for training purposes, and most officers and soldiers would only have fired maybe a hundred rounds in, in the course of their training. It was a very, very rudimentary training without a great deal of emphasis on marksmanship. It was intended as a badge of rank, a self-defense weapon, one used by military policemen, people who didn't have a combat role. 
So as I say, really the Americans are the only ones that took the, the revolver and pistol seriously. Germans were close behind the Yanks in terms of their issue of handguns, which was you know, pretty profligate, but it was more as a result of the uh, requirement to arm their occupation troops was something that they could walk out with a pistol on the hip rather than have to tote around a full length rifle. So that is the Enfield uh, number two, Mark One and Mark One Star. Some of the other funnies. Um, after Dunkirk, uh, the British were just desperate to get their hands on any, any kind of firearm that they, that they could to defend themselves with. They looked to the Americans. America had this Lend Lease program, which is a subject of a different video. It's, it's very, very complicated, but it's an incredibly important part of the story of how the British Commonwealth was able to stay in the fight until the Americans came in in late 1941. It's also a very important part of the tale of how the Soviets were able to keep fighting right through 1941, where they were basically getting their asses handed to them by the Germans. There was a privately initiated scheme <coughs> by American citizens in the aftermath of Dunkirk to um, <coughs> give Britain a gun, and they would encourage American civilians to donate firearms, which would then be packaged up and sent to the UK. So that was one supply aspect, and, and subsequently you find there's a, just a shitload of different types of handguns that found their way into the home, into the arms of the, the Home Guard and some of the training units. But when the American Lend-Lease system kicked in, we see the introduction of a number of different American revolvers. They're very, very important to the story of the whole World War II British, British Commonwealth experience. One of the most important, possibly the most important, is the Smith & Wesson Victory Pistol. It's in 38 caliber, so it's basically a police revolver, civilian revolver, uh, simplified with wooden grips and, and a war finish, but this was provided in vast numbers to the British Commonwealth. It was more popular than the Webley or the Enfield. It's just a, a slightly crisper action in both single and double action. Um, a little bit more accurate, a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, and the British took to it, so did the, the, the Brit Commonwealth troops. It was issued to air crew, um, sort of thing that they could shove down the side of their flying boot. And it, it really made it a, a very, very big contribution to the, uh, to the arming of the, of the British, British Commonwealth troops. So that's a legitimate collectible revolver, which you can throw into the British service revolver category, even though it's, it's manufactured by the Americans. Some other funnies. Um, after the operation in the torch landings in North Africa, particularly the New Zealand Division, which was about to be deployed into, into Italy, withdrew all the 38 calibers, all the 9mm, all the, the, the hodgepodge assortment of weapons that they had. And they went to the Thompson submachine gun, which fires a 45 caliber, and also were issued with the Smith & Wesson in 1917. Now this is not a 1917, it's the commercial um, production. It's in uh, 455 Ely, this one. This was also used as a Lend-Lease pistol. There was the, uh, the M1917 is a 45 caliber with a moon clip system. That was issued as the service standard for the New Zealand Division going into France. It was just a way of simplifying logistics. So you had the one caliber pistol and submachine gun caliber. So this was again a very, very popular um, revolver with those that were fortunate enough to get it. Uh, Smith & Wesson is, is generally a superior product uh, to, to anybody else. Uh, it's very hard hitting, very accurate. And as I say, it was a, it was a very desirable revolver if you could get one. Complicating life even further, we have the, the Colt News Service. This one in 455 Ely, so it's, it's taken the same calibre as our, uh, as our Webley Mark VI. This also issued in 45 with a moon clip system. So you can see it's quite a, it's quite a complicated story. And the photographic, photographic record reflects this. If you have a look at photos of the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians and the desert, and subsequently you will see officers and NCOs, uh, machine gun crews, armed with quite a startling variety of service revolvers. There was no one correct answer, certainly not for the British Commonwealth anyway. Perhaps for the British Army they were able to standardise, but the Commonwealth uh, guys just got what they could get their hands on.